Hi everybody, we're just going to give people a couple of minutes to enter the room. It always takes a little while uh, with internet connections, etc. So just give us um, a couple of minutes while we wait for everybody to join us. But welcome. Welcome. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever in the world you are joining us from. I know we have a very international crowd as ever in the event today. My name is Dr Emily Jones and I am a lecturer in the School of Law at the University of Essex. And I am, of course, the co-convener alongside my wonderful colleague, Dr. Megan Wong, of the Essex Public International Law Lecture Series. So it's my pleasure to be your host for this evening's lecture. We're very, very pleased to have with us Professor Campbell McLaughlin QC here with us today. You can see him on your screen. And he is going to present our final lecture of this term. So a really fantastic way to end the term. So I will hand over to Dr. Wong shortly to introduce our speaker, but before I do so, I just wanted to say a few words about the series. The Essex Public International Law Lecture Series is co-founded and co-convened by myself and Dr. Megan Wong. We're both international lawyers, but Dr. Wong is a formalist and I am a critical international legal scholar. So the series is really built upon our deep respect for one another's scholarship, you know, across these differences, as well as, and very importantly, our friendship. The series prides itself on building upon these two important intellectual traditions international, of international law, so formalism and international legal practice and critical perspectives. And I'm very excited that tonight's lecture is also going to be touching across um, these different themes, so a really great one for our wider audience who are interested in both sides of um, the practice of international law. So our series was inaugurated by Professor Niels Blocker of Leiden University in January of this year on the occasion of the 75th anniversary of the first Security Council resolution. And since then we've had a wonderful group of speakers join us. So this time we've been fortunate to host and learn from also Professor Larry Mauso of the University of Tartu, Dr Dina Zuvala of the Australian National University, Lucia Solano, head of the treaty section at the Colombian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Professor Marty Koskinemi of the University of Helsinki, His Excellency Judge Kriensak Kitty Chassari of ITLOS, and Professor Hilary Charlesworth of Melbourne Law School. So um, a great lineup of speakers that we've had, and, and thank you to everyone who has joined us for those lectures. And of course, we're very, very proud to be ending our term with Professor Campbell McLaughlin QC. So Dr. Wong and I would really like to take this chance and this opportunity to thank those who have supported us this term. You know, this is a new lecture series and we weren't quite sure how it would go, but we've really had so much support from so many people and, you know, we're really proud to have had so many attendees at all of our events as well. So we'd like specifically to thank Catherine Wedgwell for sharing our events on the Oxford Public International Law mailing list. Karen Facherty for sharing, that's probably really badly pronounced, sorry. I did practice before, but um, sharing on the Lauterpack Centre for International Law mailing list. Victor Manuel Bernal for sending this around the Colombian Academy of International Law, Mary Guest for posting about our events on EGL Talk, and last but definitely not least, Jacob Katz Kogan for always posting our events on the International Law Reporter. So thank you to uh, also all our colleagues and our events team and of course our audience for always being so fantastic and asking great questions. So enough from me, I would now like to take the opportunity to introduce Dr. Megan Wong who will be your chair for this evening. So Dr. Wong is a lecturer in the School of Law at the University of Essex, along with me, and is currently the director for the LLM in International Law Degree. She is a formalist, generalist, public international lawyer, and she has advised states on issues of international law and has published on canonical topics of public international law. And she is also the author of a forthcoming monograph, which is coming out with Cambridge University Press, entitled Responsibility of States and Individuals, Aggression at the International Criminal Court. So, Dr. Wong, over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jones, for the kind introduction. It has indeed been a pleasure to be your co-convener and co-chair this spring. Well, an excellent academic event is always a pleasure, but even more so when one can participate with friends and colleagues, and if I could just echo Dr. Jones in expressing my gratitude to our speakers this term and to our friends and colleagues who have joined us. A quick housekeeping note before I introduce our speaker, there will be a Q&A session towards the end, 
please feel free to type out your question in the Q&A box throughout the lecture. Also, please note that I will read out your name and your affiliations unless you click to be anonymous. Um, the title of today's lecture is Systemic Integration Revisited, and I'm privileged to introduce our speaker, Professor Campbell McLaughlin QC. Uh, professor Campbell McLaughlin QC is a professor at the Faculty of Law at Victoria University of Wellington and was elected to the Institut de Droit International in 2015, where he served as the rapporteur for the 18th Commission of the Institut, whose resolution on the equality of the parties before international investment tribunals was adopted by the Institute at its most recent session in The Hague in August 2019. His commentary on the resolution is coming out with Cambridge University Press this year. His book, Foreign Relations Law with Cambridge University Press, and more generally his work on the relationship between international law and national law, and his astonishing coverage, not only of public, but also private international law, in which he is also equally a leading light. And of course, we come to his work on systemic integration, which we revisit today. Well, we know that the name of Campbell McLaughlin is synonymous with systemic integration from his work for the research on the principle for the International Law Commission's Fragmentation Study Group in 2005 and his International and Comparative Law Quarterly article. He is currently deeply into writing the principle of systemic integration in international law for Oxford University Press to be published in 2022, which we're all looking forward to. Professor McLaughlin will be taking up the Arthur Goodhart Professorship in Legal Science at Cambridge University in October later this year, where he shall teach a master's course on international law as a legal system, and he's invited to give the general course at the Hague Academy of International Law in 2024. And now um, over to our distinguished speaker. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Wong. Um, dear friends and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, in the first decade of the present millennium, an apparently innocuous and then little used provision in the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties caught wide attention when it proved case dispositive in the decision of the International Court of Justice in oil platforms. Article 31.3c, which appears at the conclusion of the Convention's general rule of interpretation, requires that there shall be taken into account any relevant rules of international law applicable in the relations between the parties. In the hands of the International Law uh, Commission's study group on fragmentation reporting three years later in 2006, this provision was found to embody a more general principle, the principle of systemic integration. The idea was a beguilingly simple one. Since treaties are, irrespective of their subject matter, a creation of the international legal system and their operation is predicated upon that fact, the parties could be presumed to refer to international law generally for all questions which the treaty does not itself resolve in express terms and in a different way, and not to intend to act inconsistently with such principles. <clears throat> Following its embrace by the court and the commission, the principle has had a widespread impact on the development of international law. Systemic integration, hardly ever previously expressly invoked, has now become an important reasoning tool in the work of international courts and tribunals. It's been relied upon in some hundreds of decisions, but including by the International Court of Justice itself, but also by all the major international and regional specialized tribunals across every field of international law in every major region. Courts have applied the principle not simply in the resolution of incidental issues, but also to core questions that confront the decision maker. The scope of application of human rights protections in armed conflict, the limits of the national security exception provided by the law on the use of force, the extent to which the doctrine of the police powers provides a, a public health exception to the protection of investments from expropriation, to name just three of the more notable examples. But I think practical utility on its own wouldn't account for the principle's popularity. Rather, the principle opens a window into a wider consideration of what one recent writer has called the pervasive presence of systemic thinking in the discipline of international law. Well, many thanks to uh, Dr. Emily Jones and Dr. Megan Wong for such uh, uh, putting together, particularly in the trying circumstances of the previous year, 
such a wonderful series. And it's a great pleasure to be able to speak to all of you on Systemic Integration Revisited. Some personal context. I was invited by Bill Mansfield and Marty Koskinyemi to contribute to the work of the ILC study group on fragmentation back in 2005 and asked them to look at Article 31.3c. At that point, there was almost no practice and the provision was regarded as almost a footnote to the work of the study group. But in fact, a combination of the decision of the ICJ and the impulse of the commission itself as a codification body to find order amidst apparent chaos had the opposite effect and perhaps explains the prominent role accorded to Article 31.3c in the report. But at that stage, I advanced a, a larger claim that the provision, Article 31.3c, embodies a larger principle of systemic integration. This seems to have stuck, but nevertheless, I at least have never sought to explain or defend in any developed way what that might really mean or its significance. There's been in the interim a great deal of excellent scholarship, both on the application of the principle in particular contexts and also studying the interaction of different fields of international law, both at the macro level and analysing the construction of Article 31.3c itself. But despite this intense interest, there's to date been no comprehensive assessment of how the principle is actually operating in practice across the many contexts in which it's being applied in the 15 years since its adoption into the international law canon, or of its wider significance for international law more generally. This gap gives rise to a set of three related research questions. Firstly, as to the content and scope of systemic integration as a technique to mediate the relationships between substantive rules and principles. Secondly, as to the wider operation of the principle in the management of inter-institutional relations in international law, whether between courts or between international organizations. And thirdly, as to the implications of the principle for the way in which interna the international legal system as a whole can be understood. Well, these three issues, which all interlock, are the subject of my current research for a book to be published next year by Oxford University Press to which my research leave unexpectedly prolonged by the pandemic and my return to New Zealand has been devoted. Well, today with the research itself largely complete and some two thirds of the text written, this lecture is something of a midterm report. And in the uh, 45 odd minutes uh, remaining to me, what I want to do is to unpack uh, this topic in five parts. Firstly, uh, to deal with what really are the unanswered questions left uh, by the Commission's uh, report on fragmentation and their contemporary salience in a very different context to 2005. Secondly, to address some of the critiques of the doctrine, both by states and by scholars, and in, in considering in particular the impact of regime thinking and of legal pluralism, Thirdly, to consider the possible analytical approaches for, for interaction between legal rules and international law before, before putting forward my own key propositions. Fourthly, to give a couple of uh, illustrations as to how systemic integration is actually working in practice, a practice I might say, which goes well beyond Article 31.3c, using in particular the examples of the relationship between human rights and humanitarian law and armed conflict on, on the one hand, and the application of the police powers doctrine in the field of investment law on the other. And then fifthly and finally, uh, to explore uh, some implications for the way in which we might understand the international legal system and its capacity to operate. Implications which I suggest have a larger significance for the contemporary debate about the quotes, so-called rules-based international order. So turning then to the first task, the contemporary context. What then are the questions that the study group did not answer in 2006 and have remained unanswered? I suggested a moment ago that these exist in three dimensions. Firstly, at the level of legal technique. Secondly, at the institutional level. And thirdly, at the level of the nature of the international legal system as a whole. 
The principle of systemic integration provides a reasoning, legal reasoning technique addressed to the problem of relative normativity. That is to say, the means to address and reconcile conflicts of norms found in different parts of international law. The study group con concluded its report in 2006 by expressing the view that no homogenous hierarchical metacism system is realistically available to do away with the problems of conflicting rules. Instead, increasing attention will have to be given to the collision of norms and regimes and the rules, methods and techniques for dealing with them. It proposed the development of an international law of conflicts. States considering the report's conclusions in the Sixth Committee expressed in particular the view that it would be advisable for the Commission to study and ultimately recommend guidelines for the application of Article 313C, the implications of which were yet to be fully assessed. Yet in a thoughtful article written some six years later in 2012, Francois, Professor Francoise Hampson of the University of Essex argued more useful research would be on the horizontal collisions in international law and the tools available and substantive principles relevant to their determination. So at the level of legal technique, the question is simply how the principle of systemic integration actually works in practice to resolve issues arising from the interaction and conflict of substantive rules in international law. Where it fits within a broader set of techniques of interpretation and the resolution of relative normativity and what limits there might be on its ability to resolve such conflicts. Cast in the language of Article 313C itself, how is one to determine which other rules of international law are relevant and applicable? Who are the parties for this purpose and what does the requirement to take into account actually mean when considered in the light of the other elements of treaty interpretation? So that's the first set of unanswered questions, the questions of legal technique. What about the second one, institutional interaction? The point here is, is that systemic integration may also operate at the level of interactions between the institutions of international law, judicial and legislative. Adjudicatory competence in international law is by the deliberate design of states distributed variously between a heterogeneous set of tribunals that for the most part enjoy no formal or hierarchical relations into say. The point's even more striking in the case of international organizations with legislative functions. Well, the International Law Commission uh, chose to eschew in institutional questions, taking the view that the issue of institutional competencies is best dealt with by the institutions themselves. But such questions have persisted and have not been resolved. When the RST2 turned to the, uh, consider the constitution and statutes of international organizations in 2019, it had before it, but did not then adopt a resolution which merely proposed, uh, quoting John Dunn, that since no international organization is an island unto itself, such organizations in exercising their competence should pay due regard to the objects and purposes of other organizations. But not all questions of institutional interaction require institutional responses. International law itself may provide some of the solutions to the issues of institutional conflict, whether judicial or organizational. These questions are little studied in the case of courts and tribunals and hardly at all in the law of international organizations. Here, the principle of systemic integration may have a particular application to conflicts of jurisdiction and the precedential value of the decisions of other courts and tribunals. Third dimension, implications for the international legal system. Lying behind these questions, which I guess are important enough, lies a larger issue, which is simply this. What does the principle of systemic integration and its limits have to say about the nature and operation of the international legal system as a whole? For the purpose of the study group, it suffice to assume that simply that, quotes, international law is a legal system. This robust finding invites as many questions as it resolves. Does the principle support a deeper conception of integration beyond its operation as a rather exceptional extrinsic reference in treaty interpretation? To what extent, and if so, how does the principle support a larger conception of international law as a legal system that amounts to more than the sum of its disparate parts, uh, particularly in view of the fluctuate, fluctuating engagement of states, 
If it does, what does this have to say about the nature and character of such a system? Well, obviously there are no simple analogies to be drawn here from the concept of a national legal system. An answer to this question, however provisional, might provide some real insight into the capacity of international law to operate in light of the disintegrative pressures that it currently faces. This brings me to the contemporary salience of the current inquiry. These questions, I suggest, are of considerable contemporary moment um, at, as a matter of judicial and legislative practice, but they've also been under theorized at a time when the basic premise behind systemic integration faces both scholarly criticism as well as a centrifugal impulse towards disintegration in some political discourse. The contemporary context ca it casts a very different light on the principle of systemic integration than the post-millennial anxieties about fragmentation that first engaged the attention of the commission. The fragmentation debate, like now in hindsight, might be seen as an unanticipated problem of luxury. It was propelled by the speed of growth and the range and ambition of international law in the immediately preceding era of the 1990s, measurable both in terms of the conclusion and state adherence to multilateral agreements and the creation of new institutions. This isn't to say that it's possible in the atmospheric words of one recent collection of essays to bid farewell to fragmentation, if by that it were meant to suggest that the problems posed by the decentralized and diverse set of rules and institutions have simply gone away. Nevertheless, there is much force in the observation that the so-called fragmentation debate was itself sparked as a reaction to a specific set of new international rules and institutions created shortly after and in response to the events of 1989. The creation of all the new institutions, the WTO, the new criminal tribunals, the proliferation of other courts and tribunals, the conclusion of a number of major new MEAs, suggested that the key contents and contests in international law might thenceforth be not so much between the sovereignty of states and the idea of an international community as a contest between different values and institutions within international law. Well, a quarter of a century later, it's possible to see that if the fear of disintegration provoked by the extraordinary proliferation of international law is exaggerated, the question certainly remains as to how the disparate parts of international law are nevertheless to up operate harmoniously. The question's lost none of its urgency. Indeed, a backlash from some states and from rather differently motivated from some academic quarters has only intensified the importance of the question. Both at the micro level of the way in which uh, specific institutions answer specific questions and at the macro level of the system's capacity to deliver the public goods that are expected of it. Let me give you one example of each. So at the micro level, for example, consider the debate over the definition of public body in the WTO subsidies agreement in the wake of the US anti-dumping case. The appellate body in that case, reversing the panel, specifically cited Article 31 3C so as to refer to the draft articles on state responsibility, finding that the term public body must be interpreted to mean a body exercising governmental functions. In February 2020, the, the then US trade representative Robert Lighthizer finally released a report detailing uh, the objections of the then US administration to the appellate body, objections that ultimately drove the body into abeyance. One of his objections was precisely to the, to the body's definition of public body as it applies to state-owned enterprises. He maintained, carefully avoiding any reference to Article 31 3C and relying instead on the general rule of ordinary meaning in the context of the specific treaty, that the test of a public body is state ownership and not the exercise of governmental functions. Well, my point here is not to take a position on the rights or wrongs of this particular dispute on treaty interpretation, but merely to demonstrate how consequential disputes about reference to other rules outside the specific treaty regime can be. These arguments, of course, have implications in both directions. A given state may say, say things, see things rather differently when bringing state-owned enterprises within the public net for subsidy purposes of the WTO 
And when it seeks to hold the same SOE accountable for its debts against a plea of sovereign immunity on the other. Yet such a state must expect to be ready to explain and defend the coherence, the internal consistency, if you like, of its position. But I wouldn't want you to think that this is just a question of legal technique, denuded of content. The world doesn't operate in hermetically sealed chambers. At the macro level, although systemic integration has, as we shall soon see, been subject to wide ranging criticism, the need to find coherence in international law in the public purposes that it serves remains as pressing as ever. At the end of a, a rather wide ranging critique of the state of contemporary international law in 2020, Ann Orford concludes, a first step is to reject the fragmented closed worlds of international law that ask us to separate trade and investment from the law relating to human rights or environment or human security. It's a mistake, she says, to think that trade agreements and environmental agreements and human rights agreements deal with different domains or different relations. They deal with shared issues of so social relations. So it's now necessary in part two of the lecture to consider and outline the criticisms that the principle of systemic integration has faced, both from states and from scholars. Part two, critical appraisal, states. The presentation of the fragmentation report and conclusions to the Sixth Committee in 2007 occasioned generally favorable responses from states with some delegations particularly highlighting as useful the development of the objective of systemic integration. However, more recently, the specific question of the extent to which an international tribunal is entitled to look beyond the specific treaty text in addressing the issues before it has been contested by some states. And as I've already suggested, a specific context in which this has arisen is in the debates about the approach of the WTO appellate body, a, a criticism of activist judges imposing their own policy preferences on members by decisions that add or to, to or diminish WTO rights and obligations. The argument of excès de pouvoir, excessive power, that international courts and tribunals have exceeded their mandate in ways that detract from the particular obligations of the parties has also been advanced against other international courts, including the European Court of Human Rights and other regional human rights courts. For present purposes, the question is whether the principle of systemic integration is an engine of judicial activism or operates as a break upon it. There's a risk that an incautious, there's certainly a risk that an incautious or unthinking borrowing of legal concepts across regimes can produce results that violate the integrity of the party's commitments. And it is always necessary to consider the context in which each rule was developed and to compare the objects and purposes of the two regimes in order to, to determine whether the other rule in fact is relevant and applicable in the relations between the parties. This uh, may be so as much in the human rights field as it is in investment or trade. But a balanced appraisal of the judicial experience of systemic integration must critically assess, assess the extent and implications of any such transgressions. I argue that provided it's properly understood and applied, the principle so far from being a device for judicial activism in opposition to the interest of states, in fact, operates to check an excess of judicial power. It constrains the tribunal's judicial development of the law of a particular treaty by requiring the tribunal to consider how this fits with other relevant rules of international law applicable in the relations between the parties. So another example, the vice president of the European Court of Human Rights writing in her extrajudicial capacity criticizes some elements of the jurisprudence of that court precisely on the ground that it created a lex specialis interpretation for human rights treaties contrary to the approach in general international law. By contrast, where the court has expressly applied the principle of systemic integration, the result has been to ensure that its decisions remain in conformity with general international law outside the domain of human rights. External reference of this kind grounded in other rules to which the state's parties have given their consent actually ensures respect for the preferences of those states and not the imposition of judges own policy 
preferences. And in the context of the WTO, an important effect has been to preserve a policy space for domestic regulation where a single-minded trade-orientated approach would have suggested otherwise. But the, beyond the argument that systemic integration subverts the obligations of states, the principle has faced a, a range of wider objection derived from regime theory in international relations and a critique on the basis of legal pluralism in contemporary legal scholarship on the grounds that it presumes a systematicity that international law can't possibly achieve. And it's to these objections of scholars that I wish to now turn. Firstly, a world of regimes. In international relations, the issues with which we're concerned are discussed in terms of a conflict of regimes. Borrowed from its 19th century origins in the administration of rivers and other resources under international administration, the concept of the regime migrated into the field of international relations since it provided, as James Crawford and Penelope uh, Neville uh, rightly suggest, a way of having normativity in a confined space unconnected systematically to anything else. International regimes, asserted Krasner in 1982 in one of the foundational articles in that field, are defined as principles, norms, rules, and decision-making procedures which actor expectations converge in a given issue area. Well, from an international lawyer's perspective, this looks like a non-lawyer's description of the law, with the crucial difference that the implicit assumption of regime theory is that such norms are generated and operate entirely within the regime. The initial preoccupations of regime theory in keeping with its origins in game theory were with the interests and reactions of states. Regimes provided a context within which states could pursue their interests, whether egotistical or in the exercise of political power, perhaps for the common good uh, or for other particular sectoral interests. But there was a fundamental problem with the approach that focused on isolated regimes. As Rastiala and Victor pointed out in 2004, after two decades of such work, the proliferation of international institutions make it increasingly difficult to isolate and decompose individual institutions for study. Uh, the dominant functional approach of such scholarship had not given systematic attention to boundaries and interactions between institutions. So far, so good. But Rastiala and Victor's prescription in the light of this diagnosis was to advocate for the study of regime complexes, an array of partially overlapping and non-hierarchical institutions governing a particular issue area. Well, this widens the frame from the individual regime. It adds in the process an additional layer of regime complexity Um, the focus of the inquiry is not on related treaties, it's rather on divergent treaties applicable to the same sub subject area. But what this widened focus doesn't do is to go so far as to seek to embrace or analyze the possibility of an overarching international legal system. The authors identify the problem of legal inconsistencies and note that much diplomatic effort will be focused on consistency they then go, and go on to assert rather boldly that this is difficult for quotes regime architects operating in the legal paradigm because the international legal system has got no formal hierarchy and doesn't possess well established mechanisms for resolving difficult conflicts. Well, it would be an understatement to point out that this treatment of international law's capacity to manage the interaction between its sources simply fails to take law seriously, either as to its objectives or as to its mechanisms. The objectives are not simply considerations for regime architects of operating in the legal paradigm. They affect, after all, the real interests of states and their citizens. And the authors don't devote any serious attention to the available legal techniques that, are the, that, that we're concerned with here. The turn to regime complexes in international relations proceeded from the assumption that because the international legal system lacks integrated institutional frameworks, it's necessary to focus on the ways in which the actors, still primarily states, exploit the opportunities afforded by the multiplicity of institutions to their advantage. 
And the primary focus of the international relations scholarship was on norm conflicts, not on the processes of mutual accommodation. The result is that this very elaborate body of research on closely related phenomena in a cognate field offers rather little to the lawyer. It does quite well to identify and illustrate the potential sources of the problem, but focuses hardly at all on the elaborate techniques of legal reasoning that seek to resolve it. This limits the relevance of this perspective uh, for the, our pre present topic in at least four important ways. Firstly, the major premise of international rela uh, relations scholarship is that there are only complexes of regimes. There's no attempt to explain the normative foundations of those regimes, where all those international agreements and, and institutions and procedures actually come from and what gives them their normative force. The absence of such an explanation has the consequence that it's not necessary to offer any explanation of systematicity. Regimes simply arise and may variously claim application to the same subject matter, at which point they may con conflict. But this sidesteps the deliberate process of the construction of legally binding agreements and ignores the role of customary international law as providing a substrate of organizing rules. Secondly, and perhaps obviously enough, it's an approach that doesn't start from law. As Marty Koskinyemi himself comments in his critique on the effects of the American realist turn to international relations, in as much as they fail to answer the question, is this law or not, the usefulness of their propositions appeared doubtful to lawyers whose lay colleagues persisted in asking precisely that question. Thirdly, it proceeds from an assumption that the problem is one of decentralized and, there, and therefore it's assumed competing institutional authority with the consequence that the solution should be sought in the resolution of conflicting exercises of authority. Well, of course, authority is important, but it's not the case that international law is concerned only with exercises of authority or that the interaction of legal norms can be reduced to a question of the distribution of authority. In legal terms, this would be to conflate the fundamental distinction between jurisdiction and applicable law. Fourthly, the problematique with which the regime theory is concerned characterizes the issue always in terms of a conflict of regimes or norm, norms. This, of course, is the antithesis of the principle of systemic integration. This conflictual approach has in turn influenced an important strand of critical legal scholarship, which drawing on the literature of legal pluralism, conceives the relation between regimes as inherently incommensurable. And it's this, to this pluralist critique that I must now turn. So the pluralist critique says that the systemic impetus of international law cannot succeed because what's really involved is a quotes contestation about fundamentals expressed in a pluralist legal order in which law can no longer decide since the law is nothing more than the reflection of particular values and particular projects of individuals or groups in competition with the values and projects of others where recourse must be had to other often political means. The principle of um, systemic integration has been singled out for particular criticism in this context. My friend Nico Kreish is ex quite explicit uh, about this uh, in, in, uh, uh, in describing the process of systemic integration as, quotes, doomed to failure. Other writers seek to reduce systemic integration and the wider process of interpretation of which it forms part to a game in which Article 31.3 serves the function of the joker that allows disparate objectives to be achieved in disparate cont contexts, characterized as an exercise in fantasy, in which the principle soothes the anxiety of fragmentation and nurtures an illusion of harmony that can be brought about by the magic wand of the technical rules of treaty interpretation. In this practice, systemic thinking eventually opens an infinite world of possibility for lawyers, but is merely an argumentative practice which doesn't support the idea of international law as a system of rules. As Despremont frankly recognizes at stake here is the idea that international law could constitute a set of rules where relations between such rules and composite orders are systematically or, or, organized. In his view, this amounts to no more than cheap, unsophisticated and easy system design at work, doesn't support the systematic character of international law. 
Well, these arguments constitute a wide ranging theoretical assault on the idea of the systematicity of international law. For now, it suffices to state, in, uh, to telegraph really in outline five essential elements of the argument in response. First, the interpretation and application of the treaty commitments of states is not a game. To describe it as such serves to cheapen the seriousness of the issues at stake for the parties and the responsibility of the decision maker. The interpretation of legal rules, including the relation between them, does of course engage processes of legal argument. The fact that this results in disagreements between lawyers about the interpretation of a legal rule is not in itself indicative of an actual conflict of rules or of the inability of the, the law to arrive at an answer. It's merely indicative of the function of legal argument, which operates within in any legal system as a means of elucidating and testing the strength of opposing claims. Second, international law of its nature engages political considerations. As Hirsch Lauterpacht recognized so many years ago, the proposition that some legal questions are political is an understatement of what's believed to be the true position. Treaties are themselves the outcome of a political process between states in which an often complex and careful balance has been struck between competing interests and values. Treaties may also pursue different sets of interests and public goods perceived by the states as deserving of legal protection, not all of which are consistent. The point isn't that international law is somehow divorced from its political context, nor that disputes between states are incapable of settlement by political means, though it shouldn't be assumed that political processes themselves offer any easy panacea. Rather, it's simply that so long as the rule of law is recognized, they're capable of an answer uh, by the application of legal rules. In other words, resort to law imposes, imports rather a decision on a basis that's distinct and different from a political decision. It's not a mask for power. If it were otherwise, states could have no reason to resort as they so often do to law and, particular, no, and in particular, no reason to submit their dispute to third party determination. In hard cases, the principle of systemic integration plays a pivotal role because it provides a legal process through which an accommodation may be found between sometimes conflicting, sometimes conflicting interests and values underlying the rules that states have signed up to. Third, the principle of systemic integration doesn't in fact presume the unity of international law if by that were, were meant uh, a unity of primary rules, as James Crawford puts it, multilateralism never meant complete coherence of treaty practice or state interest. If states are free to join multilateral treaties, they're free to create a partly fragmented system. So what we're not trying to do here is to weld distinct regimes into a unified constitutional structure. Instead, we're merely seeking to achieve uh, what Sarah McCosker once called intero interoperability between the different elements of international law. Fourth, the international legal system isn't centralized, it's plural by the deliberate design of states through their treaty engagements. And I'm not here uh, discounting the importance of customary international law through the general practice of states. But the principle of systemic integration recognizes that uh, the plurality of states treaty engagements through its requirement that the other rules of international law be applicable in the relations between the parties. Fifth, at a basic level, the transposition of ideas of legal pluralism as an explanation of the ex interactions between multilateral rules and institutions suffers, in my view, from a basic failure of analogy. It's simply not comparing like with like. Legal pluralism, on which I in fact wrote my PhD some decades ago, is concerned with explaining the persistence of different normative systems applying within the same sphere and to the same persons. The paradigm case is the relation between the customary law of an indigenous people and state law. In that context, the key point is that each normative system originates from a different source. Customary law is autochthonous, it springs from the norms and practices of the indigenous group, whereas this national legal system is promulgated by the institutions of the state. <clears throat> 
But the interaction of multilateral fields within international law is all about the interaction of rules and institutions that have all been created by the same persons, states, using the same legal form, the multilateral treaty, which itself is a creature of international law. So I now need to explain in part three at the level of technique, what it is that an approach premised upon systemic integration can actually offer, starting first with a consideration of how it is to be distinguished from other possible alternative approaches before advancing some key propositions of my own. Three, argument. I need first to be clear about the limits of, of integration within the larger process of interpretation before considering the role of lex specialis, the potential for a choice of law approach, the problem of irresolvable or strategically created norm conflicts, and distinguishing the approach that I'm discussing here from a constitutionalist account of international law. Systemic integration is concerned with determining the relationship of a particular rule of the uh, legal system with other rules. Just as its importance shouldn't be underestimated, it would be a mistake to overstate its significance uh, in the ordinary run of instances. No legal system could operate if wide scale reference were always required in order to interpret and apply its specific rules. International law is no exception. Instead, the principle operates where direct reference does not su suffice. And in any event, integration operates as part of a larger process of interpretation, which starts from the general rule in Article 31, inviting the interpreter to focus on the treaty itself, its terms, its object and purpose, its context. It's also the case, of course, that general international law is largely composed of rules of a directory character, and it follows from that, that states are free to choose to contract out of general law so that identification of the differences required by a treaty is just as important as uh, considering their relation to general international law. Well, the centrality of the party's specific conventional agreement vis-a-vis -vis general law naturally invites consideration of whether this in turn imports a more general principle, the principle of lex specialis, that specific law derogates from the general law. Might this principle provide an alternative solution for conflicts between treaties that eschews integration, preferring instead a priority rule in favor of the more specific set of rules? This principle, conspicuous by its absence from the Vienna Convention, continues to be widely invoked. And I'm going to consider in a moment uh, the attempt of the International Court of Justice uh, to utilize this as a means of the relationship between. Uh, human rights and humanitarian law. But what I want to suggest is that a preference for lex specialis cannot on its own resolve the horizontal conflicts between treaty laws, because what's normally involved is a process of accommodation between uh, rules, not a simple once and for all choice between them. And that would also be a, a problem with the solution that's sometimes been suggested in this field of making a choice between uh, applicable law, a choice of applicable law uh, between uh, different regimes. That system familiar to all private international lawyers operates in private international law because it deals with inter-systemic conflicts between national legal systems, each of which provides their own complete set of rules governing the same private law relations. But by contrast, the set of issues uh, which we're concerned with here are all concerned with the interaction of diverse rules within the system of public international law. They're intra-systemic, not inter-systemic. I'm going to pass over the problem of irresolvable uh, norm conflicts, and we can come back to that in uh, discussion if there's time. Uh, and I want to turn instead to the key propositions which I myself uh, advance. First, I say that so far from being a pathological state of affairs, the potential for conflict of norms and institutions is inherent in any legal system, 
international law differs only in the context in which the problems arise and the methodology to uh, be applied to their solution. International law has to cope not only with the interactions between its various specialist, specialized regimes, but also with the variable participation of states. In the resolution of such conflicts, systemic integration fulfills a central role. It's not just a technique of treaty interpretation, it also serves as a larger organizing principle in the operation of international law. It expresses a larger truth about the nature and operation of the international legal system as a whole, which isn't a monolith, but rather a dense and shifting web of rights and obligations. This means that the applicable international law is continuously constituted and reconstituted through a process of legal reasoning in which systemic integration forms the pivotal part. It's this discursive reasoning process itself that constitutes the systemic aspect of international law working to bind its disparate elements together. This is only possible because the disparate and constantly shifting web of obligations assumed by states on the international plane can be envisaged and operationalized as part of a legal system. As the International Court of Justice put it, a rule of international law doesn't operate in the vacuum, it operates in relation and in the context of a wider framework of legal rules of which it forms only a part. The object of such a legal reasoning process is to produce coherence between legal rules, that is to produce logical relations bet ships between them that may be related to the larger objectives of the system as a whole. How then can international law answer that question, achieve the coherence that may be expected of a legal system in light of the sovereign equality of states? It does so precisely because the principle is itself grounded upon the mutual sovereign decisions of the respective states. It's founded on common state consent at two levels. Firstly, because the principles found in the Vienna Convention itself in a general rule of interpretation, which is accepted to be a rule of custom. But second, uh, because the starting premise of the rule requires that the other rules of international law be applicable in the relations between the parties. And this latter requirement ensures that the integration that's achieved is always premised upon the applicability of the relevant rules on a mutual basis to the relations between the parties themselves. In other words, the rule is premised upon sovereign equality. Now, of course, that's a very different model of internal coherence than that which may be expected of a national legal system, precisely because it makes the determination of the applicable rules contingent on the common acts of sovereign will of the parties to be bound by the resulting law determination. It's a coherence formed of sovereign will, not imposed upon it. My fourth proposition is that the very process of establishing the relationships between legal rules, whether conventional or customary, necessitates reference to general principles of law. That's because, and here I quote uh, the late Professor Neil McCormick, the coherence of a set of norms is a function of its justifiability under higher order principles. This explains the important role that reference to general principles enjoys in cases in which international tribunals have invoked systemic integration. Such principles express both the basic logical premises of the system and the principles that animate or serve to explain its constituent elements. Now, I'm not here saying that the interests that the international legal system seeks to protect are always consistent. On the contrary, international law must accommodate interests and objectives that are capable of conflicting. The result is not to deny the political significance of the choices involved in international disputes or in the institutional choices for the distribution of values in the world, or to assert that law is exclusively competent to make those choices. But it is to insist that where those uh, choices are submitted to legal decision, they're capable of an answer by uh, the application of legal rules, that is to say, by a distinctively legal process. In the hard cases, the fundamental diverse, 
values within the system must uh, must be assessed so as to achieve a working accommodation. As judges Higgins, Coymans, and Bergenthal pointed out in their separate opinion in the arrest warrant case. So let me turn now in part four, having set out my stall as it were, as to what I say the key elements of the operation of the principle are, um, to consider how a, a cup, just a couple of examples of how the principle has actually been applied. The first in the relationship between human rights and humanitarian law in armed conflict, and the second uh, in the application of the police powers doctrine in the field of international investment law. So firstly, the law of war and peace. One of the most vexed areas of conflict between fields of international law has been that between international humanitarian law and human rights law as it applies in the context of armed conflict. Here, there appears to be a basic conflict between a set of rules that guarantees the right to life and liberty for all persons and the rules of humanitarian law that accept the realities of armed conflict, including the reality of killing and detention, preferring to subject the conduct of warfare uh, to legal disciplines. One finds in the treaties, despite the fact uh, that ma many of the basic principles were negotiated at precisely the same time, almost no express guidance on how the two sets of rules are, are to interact. And as I mentioned briefly earlier, the International Court of Justice, when first confronted with this question, sought to adopt a, a lex specialis approach, giving priority to humanitarian law over human rights law. But sustained engagement with the issues both in that court and in the major regional human rights systems in the Americas, Europe and Africa has demonstrated that invoking Lex Specialis raises more questions than it answers. To say something is Lex Specialis doesn't resolve what's to be done with the two rules. Does it mean the total displacement, partial displacement or the avoidance of conflict between the two rules by interpreting one by reference to the other? Nor does it tell us how we're to judge specificity. Is this a question of subject matter or the content of the rule itself? After all, some human rights rules indeed are more specifically framed than those in IHL. So Lex Specialis might work well to govern vertical relationships between legal rules, as for example, in the ordinary relationship between custom and treaty. It doesn't seem very well adapted to deal with horizontal relations of the kind we're concerned with here. And this is, the, this is the conclusion that has been eventually reached after some indirections by both the Inter-American Court and by the European Court of Human Rights, in the latter case in the Hassan decision on uh, detention. To the purest, the approach on detention in Hassan operates only to write into the European Convention a set of qualifications to personal liberty that finds no warrant in Article 5 of the Convention and goes well beyond the permissible extent of interpretation. The fact is that the Geneva Conventions do provide a set of rules that are of almost universal application and, that, and which relate to armed conflict. From the perspective of the actors, states and competents, these rules are applicable and relevant. They can't just be ignored, nor can states lightly be placed in a position where one set of international rules of almost universal application provides that detent detention can in certain circumstances be legal, while another set apparently outlaws the same conduct. The court eventually reached that view that a mutual accommodation between these two equally applicable bodies of law had to be achieved and it invoked Article 31 3C in order to do so. So let me take a second example from a completely different area, the protection from expropriation in international investment law. In Philip Morris in Uruguay, in which the tobacco company Philip Morris complained that the uh, restrictions placed upon the use of its trademark by plain paper packaging legislation constituted an, uh, an indirect expropriation, Uruguay submitted that these restrictions represented a legitimate use of its police powers for the purpose of public health. But Morris said that the test for expropriation admitted of no such exception. The tribunal responded as follows. 
the tribunal disagrees. As pointed out by the respondent, Article 5 of the treaty must be interpreted in accordance with Article 31.3c of the Vienna Convention, applying any other relevant rules of international law, a reference which includes customary international law. The tribunal's decision on this question entailed a three-step analysis. First, Article 31.3c provided the entry point through which other rules could be taken into account in the interpretation of the meaning of expropriation or the deprivation of property. <clears throat> Second, through this mechanism, the tribunal referred to the police powers doctrine as a rule of general international law, which provides that measures necessary for the protection of public health do not constitute expropriation. Thirdly, the tribunal took into account the framework convention on tobacco control in concluding that the measures had been introduced bona fide for the purpose of protecting the public welfare were non-discriminatory and proportionate. And it was these three steps that cumulatively enabled the tribunal to balance investor rights and the state's right to regulate. So those are just two very, very short examples of how tribunals have sought in rather hard cases uh, to apply the principle of systemic integration to the issues before them. But in the five minutes remaining to, remaining to me, uh, in part five of the lecture, I want to, to turn to consider the wider implications uh, um, of the existence of a principle of systemic integration for the idea of an international legal system. Because, of course, embedded within the principle are three concepts, principle, system, and integration, which are not self-explanatory, and which indeed in the context of international law are contested. As I've said, for the international, uh, for the ILC study group, it sufficed simply to, insert, to assert that international law is a legal system. But significant doubts remain. Some scholars have questioned whether Article 31.3c can really bear the weight resting, uh, placed upon it as a principle beyond the occasional reference in the course of interpretation of particular treaty instruments. Others have asked more fundamentally whether the often, often disparate parts of international law can be conceived as a coherent system. As I've said, the pluralist, pluralist critique is that this is neither possible nor desirable. Pluralism in law and institutions, so the argument goes, dictates pluralism in law as well. As Fisher and Lascano and Teubner argued so influentially, any aspirations to normative unity are doomed from the outset. What this invites is a consideration of what is distinctive about the systematicity of international law. Of course, it was that it was the claim to the systematicity of international law and not its legal character as such that HLA Hart so famously doubted in the final chapter of his concept of law when he described international law as rules which constitute not a system but a simple set. The center of the context in which this question arises lies the formal source that above all characterizes contemporary international lawmaking, namely the multilateral treaty. Despite or perhaps because of the ubiquity of multilateral treaties, conceptions of the systematicity of international law have tended to fall back on custom as the common law of the international community, and in particular on the concept of secondary rules, rules of recognition, change, and adjudication. There's more than a little irony in this, since it was HLA Hart who developed the distinction between primary and secondary rules, and it was precisely because he took the view that international law lacked a convincing set of secondary rules that he denied its systematicity. Well, the typical response of international lawyers has been to remonstrate that international law does, at least now, have a set of secondary rules that is much more developed than Hart credited. Yet for myself, I doubt that this really gets at the distinctive category of the international legal system. To anybody working in the field, there's something strikingly inaccurate about Hart's reduction of international law to a simple set of separate rules. That if the defining character of, the, of contemporary international law is that 
the is that the practice of concluding multilateral treaties itself is constitu uh, constitutive of the system. What Hart's approach does is to downgrade the, grade the significance of this in a radical way by posing the question of the existence or not of an international legal system as one concerned with an ultimate rule of recognition. He's able to treat all treaties as if they were just comparable to ordinary contracts and to admit any serious consideration of the lawmaking function of them. The result is that Hart's search for an ultimate rule of recognition leads him directly to custom through the route of the rule of Pactus and Savanda. And he uh, discards that because, as he says, not all obligations under international law arise from Pacta, however widely that term is construed. So what Hart does is set up a characteristic of municipal legal systems, their capacity to legislate with general application to the population and to record international law as lacking systematicity in, unless and until it can acquire such a character. But such reasoning doesn't admit of the possibility that international law may be a legal system that reflecting its different nature simply operates in a different way. It provides no explanation for the way in which those charged with the interpretation and application of the rules of international law find their meaning in part through consideration of the connections between such rules, the quality of coherence. So I want to suggest that a core feature of the systematic character of international law specifically is the manner in which its various norms interact or interlock. This doesn't require international law to, explain, to display all of the other characteristics that we would expect of a legal system. It's a separate criterion of systematicity. So I can state my conclusions then in a rather brief set of propositions. First, in important respects, international law derives its systematicity precisely from the manner in which its rules interlock, that's to say, derive their meaning from other relevant rules of international law. Two, this can be understood as a specific aspect of legal hermeneutics, the ways in which lawyers derive meaning and intention from words in their wider context, it's an, which is an essential part of all legal reasoning. But it's not only this. Three, systemic integration may properly be called a principle because it implements through interpretation and norm application an essential attribute of legality, namely the coherence of rules one to another. This doesn't mean consistency judged by reference to identity of result or material unity. It means that the operation of the legal rules to which states parties themselves have consented as being applicable to them must be assessed and judged by reference to their interrelationship Four, in this process, the identification of the larger principles that animate the legal system, the international legal system, takes on renewed importance. This is not because such principles necessarily trump the importance of rule identification. It's because, as in any legal system, principles help us to make sense of rules, particularly in those cases in which rules intersect or appear to conflict. This is incidentally the real importance in my view of the second limb of the IOC's current project on general principles of law, principles formed within the international legal system. Five, finally, in light of the ongoing political discourse about international law, so memorably described by Crawford as a dialogue of the deaf, it really does matter to articulate clearly the capacity of international law to operate as a legal system. This is not to deny the political significance of the interests at stake, but rather to insist, as Hirsch Lauterpark put it, that all international disputes are, irrespective of their gravity, disputes of a legal character in the sense that, so long as the rule of law is recognized, they are capable of an answer according to legal rules. Thank you very much. Okay, well then, um, please join me in thanking our speaker um, Professor Campbell McLaughlin today for joining us um, all the way from Wellington. So thank you for being here. It's been really a pleasure, and I, I'm I'm so um, I'm so pleased that we could end our spring term program with this really magisterial lecture on systemic integration. Yeah, um, Dr. Jones, if you want to.
No, just to say thank you very much. I learned so much. There was so much detail there. I've written my hand off. So um, thank you very much, Campbell. And thank you to our wonderful audience for those really detailed questions. Um, so that was fantastic. Um, yeah, thank you, everyone. And do join us next time. We'll be releasing our events program next term soon. Um, and we have some great people lined up, as you can hopefully imagine by now. So thank you. <laughs> And just to say bye from me, and uh, I hope very much to be able to see many of you in person, God willing, uh, later in the year. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.